Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Mercury FDI Talks. Uh, of course, is the premier uh, podcast for FDI for indirect investment. Our guest for today is a pleasure to have uh, with us Kurt Nifinkar, um, uh, very well known person from the FDI field. Uh, uh, Kurt, thank you very much for being here with me. Thanks for having me. Uh, but for those that uh, don't know you, let's uh, have a bit of a background on you. Uh, who is Kurt Nifinkar and what's your uh, relationship with FDI? Okay, well, I, I'm an FDI lady from, from way back, I would say. I've spent um, most of my career as a journalist, um, mainly working for the Financial Times, running their FDI magazine, which is part of the FDI intelligence division that includes the magazine and data. I later launched a publication called Investment Monitor, which is other kind of publication in this space. But about a year and a half ago, I went independent. And now I do a mix of still some journalism. Um, I'm a contributing editor for a really great publishing group called Real Asset Media that covers the intersection between FDI and real asset investment. Um, I write a column for Forbes on FDI, but now I'm becoming a little bit more of a practitioner and do some consulting advising governments on the attraction of FDI. And very importantly, I'm a senior advisor for the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, which is the main global body representing the entities charged with attracting inward investment. I believe you have done an interview as well with our WIPA CEO, uh, Ishmael, which is really great. So I'm very pleased to follow in his footsteps. So I would say that I uh, began mainly as a journalist, but after covering FDI for a number of years, I really fell in love with this industry and with this topic. Indeed. So everything I, I do now in my professional life is centered in some way on foreign direct investment. And uh, what was the, the reason you went to this field? Was it um, uh, brought up by life itself or was did, did you choose to go into FDI? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I'd say a combination. Um, I first became aware of the concept of FDI and the importance when I was still in Alabama in the United States where I'm from. Um, that state had a slightly old-fashioned economy that was struggling, the classic case of textile freeze, um that moved to Asia and left the state struggling. And the state went all in on trying to attract a major automotive factory, landed an enormous factory from Mercedes-Benz in the 90s, which really revolutionized the entire economy of the state. It now gets um, more FDI per capita than most of the U.S. states. Now the leading industry is automotives. Now they make airplanes. So I was a senior in university at the University of Alabama at the time, and this was such a big thing that was happening, and it really struck me, and I found it very interesting. Um, I was always dead set on being a journalist. I went to journalism school. I moved to Washington, which is a great place for journalists, um, a magnet for all the world's journalists. I thought that I wanted to be a political journalist because I always had an interest <laughs> in politics. But then I ended up getting a job in Washington at a magazine called Global Business, which was essentially about FDI. It was read by American companies, but it was all about international expansion. And first of all, I realized that would allow me to travel, which is something that I desperately wanted to do, rather than hanging around in Washington, um, covering the ins and outs of legislative policy on Capitol Hill. <laughs> I realized it wasn't as interesting up close as it might seem from afar. But crucially, international business is so connected to politics that it, it's the other side of the coin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I ended up studying international politics at University of Edinburgh in the UK. Um, and after that, I got a job in London um, running a magazine on trade finance, which is so still international finance. Then the Financial Times had launched a brand new publication at that time focused on foreign direct investment. And they actually approached me and asked me to run it. And that was something of a dream job. Of course. Because by then I'd already got into the topic of international business. And again, I realized that FDI, and one of the reasons I love it, it is that intersection between business, trade, investment, and politics, but it has exactly. societal implications as well. And after that, I kind of fell in love with, with 
the world of FDI, uh, which now I, I can never leave. I can never leave. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's very important because first important thing that you said is that you went in for the travel. This, I think this, this is what got all of us into this field. Yeah. It definitely. Uh, and uh, it combines, as you said, uh, business, it combines politics, combines everything that makes it exciting. Um, well, it's great. I mean, uh, you, you wanted to start as a, uh, as a political journalist. It's not too far. It's not Absolutely. too far. Yeah. Uh, so um, you've been all these years in this field. So what's your idea of the current landscape of FDI around the world? We, we have a lot of um, challenges uh, and opportunities uh, when it comes, of course, to AI and digitalization. So what is your um, opinion on the current FDI landscape? It's certainly very challenging. I mean, we've been through some of these cycles before, but, you know, there was the kind of cataclysmic crash in FDI brought on by COVID. But just as we were getting optimistic about a recovery, that recovery got stalled in many ways by a yeah. confluence of different crises from military conflict and geopolitical tension to spiraling inflation, interest rate trouble. And all of this has heightened the risk sensitivities of companies, but also impacted a bit their ability to hedge um, and their their cash flow for international expansion. So that kind of halted the recovery that we were hoping for. Um, now the latest numbers, you know, from from UN Trade and Development suggest that we did have a small rebound last year of three percent, which was kind of better than hoped for. But that's still very lukewarm as far as recoveries go. Whereas in the past, when we've had these big dips from from a crash, they've come kind of storming back. So I think it's a, a challenging market. Um, a lot of those factors that, that dampen the recovery are still in play um, and haven't necessarily improved. However, uh, there, there are opportunities. I mean, one of the big trends, of course, is that global value chains are really shifting and shifting rapidly. The pandemic caused a rethink for companies on where their global footprints are and, of course, on their supply chain, expose some vulnerabilities. So they're thinking more about shortening supply chains. We're seeing big trends around nearshoring and friendshoring. So with all these value chains and supply chains shifting, many countries do have an opportunity to find the new and potentially better place in those value chains. But of course, that also brings risks for those who may land in, in not such a good place. And there are always kind of winners and losers when you're seeing these wholesale changes. So investment promotion agencies have always had difficult jobs. FDI is very competitive, but I would say it's exceptionally difficult um, as a line of work at this current moment. Okay. And I remember the most important thing from our, our conversation with the uh, executive director of WIPA was that the investors are still unaware of the investment promotion agency. So uh, there is a big gap there. So do you agree with this statement? And what, what do you think we should do to um, connect the two dots? I definitely agree with that statement. You'll find many surveys um, that suggest that companies are not always aware that they'll go and make investments without even engaging the investment promotion agency. They will talk to other companies. They'll go to chambers of commerce. They'll talk to their advisors, um, their lawyers, their bankers, their accountants. And it's a real shame because, of course, the IPAs have value that they could add and support that they could offer to companies. Um, but this this means that there is a clear need for more advocacy on, you know, on the part of the IPAs themselves, because they also have to prove their worth in their own locations to their political paymasters. They're, they have to fight exactly. all the time for their budget and exactly. show that they're adding value. But this is a, is a core remit of WIPA and is really highlighting the importance of an organization like WIPA to speak for that industry and to advocate on behalf of IPAs because there would be a real benefit on both sides. I mean, for the IPAs, if they were able to play a more active role in more investments, they could add value and show value. But for the companies, they may be missing out on a lot of support in a very practical sense that the IPAs could provide to them when they're expanding into new markets. So we need to bridge this gap. It's very important. Is it easier uh, to uh, bridge this gap with this uh, digital transformation that we can pass information so much easier now? So uh, your opinion on the, on the digital transformation? Oh, 
absolutely. This does have the potential to make much of this easier because of course, by using digital tools, when it comes just to sheer promotion, the investment promotion agencies can reach wider audiences. Um, marketing tech solutions give better intel on the audiences so you can get a better understanding of how your message is resonating with different audience groups. You can even understand which companies are out there looking for information on, on your region or your country. So there's a lot of intel that can be leveraged to help create efficiencies, but also by using AI, it helps with inquiry handling. So um, when, when investors come onto the site, if, if the website is good, if the website's using data um, and, and is providing the information at one touch that an investor would need to complete its initial you know, bit of research, um, some agencies like Invest Estonia are extremely good at this and are using chatbots and using it for inquiry handling. Now, you still need an actual person. You want to be able to provide that handholding and that support. But for general outreach and handling inquiries, there is a clear role for AI and digital tools to play. The difficulty is it's hard to understand. A lot of IPAs don't know yet how to best use those tools. And it, it's so technology is changing so rapidly. By the time you get a handle on on one, one thing, it's moved on to the next exactly. phase. So exactly. There's a lot of confusion around it. <laughs> but I think this digitalization can be very beneficial if deployed in an efficient um, and smart manner. As part of your services now that you are a practitioner and you, uh, you're more into um, um, connecting, I suppose, uh, mm -hmm. investors with uh, opportunities, and uh, do you work also with uh, digital um, um, products, let's say? Do you, um, what, what exactly do you do? Let's, uh, let's understand a bit more about what you do now. Sure. So I try a little bit to stay in my lane in, in that I, I want to help the investment promotion agencies, first of all, with their communications, because that's my background. So is their collateral fit for purpose? Are they offering the types of information that investors need to have? Is it readable? Is it understandable? Um, are they creating investable projects? And again, pitching that in the right way to investors. So that's the core piece. There is another piece that, that gets into the actual outreach. For that, I partner with very experienced FDI lead generators to do that outreach. Now, the outreach only works if you do your research properly. And to do your research properly to identify relevant companies that can be targeted, you do need data and intelligence and various tools. There are a lot of them out there. Um, there's Hoover's, there's Dun and Brad Bradstreet, there's FDI Markets from, from FDI Intelligence. And it's very useful to use these tools to kind of tailor your search. Um, but again, you still need that piece of someone actually reaching out to them in a sophisticated way, speaking their language and trying to understand that company's strategy and needs to see if it's a fit with that location. So that is a part of my work. Um, I think events are, are still also important. And that's another area in which I work because the digital tools are useful, but you still need some of that in-person interaction. And I will advise the clients on creating a good investment forum tailoring the agenda, the right speakers, the right pitch, and, do, and doing professional moderation. So that is the other aspect. An area that I'm moving more and more into, which is fits how the market is evolving, which is not being so strict on just greenfield FDI attraction, but looking beyond that at financing and investment around large infrastructure projects, um, and looking at portfolio investment and, and the broader funding sources and the bigger universe of inward investment to help support, for example, state-backed projects that are essential to FDI in, in the world of both hard infrastructure and social infrastructure. And I'm playing a bit of a connecting role with understanding the governments and their needs around these big projects and matching them. Uh, with sources who can actually help them achieve those goals. And that's a kind of new, exciting realm that I've entered into uh, with my company. So you work with also with institutional investors, as I suppose, with this, uh, for these kind of projects or um, yes. what kind of investors yes. do you target? And also working with the IPAs to, again, help them. That requires a slightly different language than what they're used to, um, than, than 
pitching a company to make a greenfield investment. So, and this is also part of the work that WIPA is doing as well um, to help educate on how to talk to institutional investors um, because it, again, it's a slightly different pitch. And that's something I'm quite passionate about these days and I think is very important um, in terms of the education and capacity building for IPAs to take that bigger focus and see how they can support um, the broader aims of their governments in attracting um, investment at all levels. So uh, it's, is it safe to say that you are an investment promotion company? Right. Instead of an agency, it's a company that serves the agencies. Is that uh, exactly what say you that's do? correct? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Personally, I do know you. Um, I've watched you um, also from social media, also from your uh, own contributions to uh, to magazines and to different uh, sites. So I know that for our audience, uh, you would be an appropriate person to give them an. Uh, advice, okay, give an advice to investment promotion professionals and also for aspiring investment pro pro promotion professionals, what do they need to have in mind uh, for this job? Well, I think for the investment promotion agencies themselves, it really is about being on top of these trends and understanding where the market is going and thinking very carefully about how how your location fits into these uh, new new investment dynamics um, and always adapting and fine tuning your offer to meet the needs of the companies. And that requires understanding how the needs and demands and challenges of multinational companies and in international investors more broadly is evolving. So that requires a kind of continuous education. Um, then there is, of course, that communication bit. So it starts with the product and understanding what the offer is. But then it is about how to communicate it, how to speak the language of investors. Um, there's some things that sound really basic, but they're not always done, which is always having an up-to-date, uh, good professional website that's providing at one touch the at least essential level of information that an investor would want to have. Then, as we talked about, um, leveraging digital tools to create efficiencies and to improve the outreach. I think these have always been the fundamentals of investment promotion, but they are the fundamentals for a reason because they're desperately important. And they're even more important, I think, when this market is so challenging. You know, what I really empathize with IPAs for is actually creating a unique message is incredibly difficult um, because so many locations are saying the same thing. If you look around, you know, at the literature, the marketing collection. Totally agree. It's totally all agree. strategic location. So yes, you need to highlight that you have those things, but those things should be communicated as basics. But what else do you have that's unique? And of course, it means looking at the industries of the future. And that's part of understanding where the market is going. So where is the demand? What sectors are in decline when it comes to FDI? Which sectors are growing? So AI, as we've talked about, can be used as a tool for the agencies themselves. But it's also a growth area for inward investment. And actually, there's some data um, suggesting that AI is the number one skill that's in demand for jobs. So if you look at what employers are searching for at a global level in terms of the roles that they're hiring and recruiting for, they're all focused on AI, or that's the, the most popular uh, recruitment need. And that means, of course, that that gets into making sure the workforce is fit for the industries of the present, but also the future. And that is very difficult, but requires working hand in hand with the educational institutions in your jurisdiction. So everything has to be about adapting to the current situation, but always with an eye to the future. And of course, that's very easy to say. It's very difficult to do. But that's, of course. That, that has to be done in order to stay competitive for FDI. Exactly. Uh, let me go back to one, one thing that you said, uh, that there is a different uh, kind of communication to uh, large investors for infrastructure and different for Greenfield and, of course, other forms of investment. What makes it so different? And how can people uh, target different segments? Yeah, and I guess the best way to think about these is a, a corporate investor versus a financial investor. So the corporate investor is your typical Greenfield project. Their decision-making, those projects are going to be physical and they're going to be long-term. 
So their considerations are around those factors of workforce, of course, cost. They're looking for stability. They need land. They need utilities. They need physical premises and they need workers. Um, so these are the things that they're looking at. A financial investor is, it sounds obvious, but making a financial investment. Not necessarily, it is about that location because the economic fundamentals of that country, its investment grade, um, its credibility will come into play, but it's more about investing in an actual project. It's a financial investment. So they're looking at returns. At returns. Um, and you have to speak the language of financial investment again, which is slightly different than speaking the language of corporate expansion. There okay. is some crossover, of course, and, and some talking points. But one thing you'll see is that you know, if you're looking, um, you, you'll have IPAs that are just used to this one way of talking. But if if you're dealing with financial investors and it's all about, are they going to fund, they want to be involved in a PPP project and fund a major transportation project, the workforce doesn't come into it. Yes, it is a lower level who's building the thing, but that's this completely different conversation. And the numbers that they would expect to see, the financial models have to be really sound. And that's the piece that is often missing. And this is where there is this increasing urgency and conversation around bankable projects and investable projects. And that is slightly different than having an investable location for a corporate. Is it a faster decision, uh, the financial investment yeah. than the... Uh, okay, yes, yeah. of course. Because of the nature of greenfield investment that you're going to build a, a factory and you're going to put a physical footprint there, it's slightly different consideration and different process. Okay, uh, let's understand a bit what you have in mind about the future. Uh, what do you expect to have, to happen in uh, 2024? And of course, beyond up to 2030, uh, your opinion, of course. What I'm hoping, so predictions are very difficult. I'm hoping that at least our, our slightly modest recovery that happened last year in terms of the FDI figures can continue. Um, because a lot of these factors that led to the decline are ongoing, but we kind of know what they are now. I'm hoping that that creates at least a stability of expectations and that when the numbers are finally crunched for 2024, I hope that we will see another very small, um, a small recovery, but time's going to tell on that. I do think that these these shifts in, in value chains is going to continue to take place. I don't think all the pieces have landed yet. So that remains to be seen in the longer term. Um, who are the kind of winners and losers of this reconfiguration? I think inevitably digitalization, technology, AI are going to continue to be disruptors in good and bad ways, not only okay. to FDI itself and how companies choose to locate, how they structure their operations, where their workers sit, how their workers work, is going to continue to have enormous implications for FDI. And of course, that also will, will change the nature of the business of investment promotion itself. Will we see a, a growing trend in FDI? What, what is your expectations on that? Maybe I'm too optimistic, but I'm, I'm hoping and counting on a small bump in FDI. A small bump still? For 2024. That's what let's I'm hope everyone. Yeah, let's hope everyone because this is it's an exciting field and we're all into it for the excitement, of course. Um, we love the conversation, Kearney. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. It's really great to speak with you. Uh, everyone, that was Courtney Finkar, uh, another episode of uh, American Media Talks. <laughs>